Uh, I just want to start by saying I, I think we're all, you know, we're all coming to this from a place of we know the information about how bad climate change is, how scary it is, how devastating it is, and we don't need to, you know, rehash details about that. Um, but, but my question for all of us is, um, knowing what we know, how do we live as if that truth were really true? Um, I think I kind of survive and get through my life by, um, by having periods of, of ignoring it or imagining, you know, maybe things will get better. And, um, and so what would it look like if we really um, were all uh, taking action um, toward the, the transformation at the speed and scale that we need? Um, so that's a, that's a question I've been sitting with for a, a long time um, and trying to figure out in my, in my life, um, you know, what do I do knowing, knowing this truth that I know? And, um, and it's been really hard. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope that I can uh, try and help, help people get, uh, get less stuck, um, get more, uh, get more happy about being alive right now in these crazy times. Um, so, you know, some of the questions that I've been um, been wrestling with in my life are, um, you know, some of them are, are lifestyle questions. You know, how do I get around? Do I have a car? What do I eat? Is it okay to eat meat or dairy? You know, what, where do I live? Um, uh, you know, those, those kinds of lifestyle questions. Um, there's also, for me, the big, big question about having children um, and deciding whether to do that or not, um, both because of the future that they would face and also um, because of the impact that their being alive will have on the world and the rest of the people in it. Um, so that has been a very live issue for me that I've thought about a lot. And um, I won't take us down that rabbit hole unless people are interested in talking about that. Um, but I'm also totally happy to dig into it if it's um, something people are interested in. Um, so that's, that's been another of, of the big questions. Um, and then um, uh, maybe the biggest one has been just, uh, where do I spend my time and energy? What do I do with my one wild and precious life? Um, as Mary Oliver says it, um, you know, how do I decide what to do? And I, you know, I graduated from college and I, I didn't see the, the huge multiplicity of paths you know, I kind of, I, I finished this environmental science degree and I was like, well, I could go to grad school and be a professor. Um, and that didn't seem like at all anything I wanted to do. Um, Nathan Phillips, notwithstanding, I think he's a great model of being a professor. Um, but I just didn't, I didn't see um, a good path for me in that. Um, so, and then the other, the only other thing I could think of was, well, I have to be a community organizer. That's how you make change in the world that's what I have to do. Um, and I just don't have the right temperament for it. Um, you know, I'm not extroverted enough. Um, it, I just didn't, you know, I was like, I have to do this to be a good moral person. Um, and I just, you know, I kind of left feeling like I didn't know what to do with myself um, or how I, how I could possibly be um, an agent of change, um, which is kind of really sad. I wish I'd been able to get, get stuff a little bit more figured out a little bit earlier, but um, yeah, so then I, you know, I came out asking these, I, you know, asking questions about, um, or I think one of the big realizations I had was um, that just, um, just changing things about my own lifestyle is not going to save the world. Um, you know, I grew up, I was a kid in the 80s, and I, I grew up with that book, 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Save the Earth, um, which is good, and we should all do those things. Um, but I figured out that, you know, just like changing light bulbs and never getting in a car um, was not going to change the whole system that's causing climate change. Um, and that was really discouraging for me because I didn't really understand um, how, you know, how to be part of the something bigger that I knew we needed. Um, so there's kind of that question of um, lifestyle changes work versus working on bigger things. And um, I read this great book, um, in the last couple of years um, called The Parent's Guide to Climate Revolution um, oh. by a woman named Mary DeMocker, um, who's an activist in Oregon. And, um, and one of the things she says is, um, you know, I don't garden, 
I don't feel guilty about it. Like gardening is great if it gives you joy and helps you feel connected to life. That's awesome. Um, but you know, like I'm not able to grow enough of my own food to make a big impact on the global food system. So what I want to do is be contacting my legislature, my legislators and, you know, pushing for the, the policies that we need uh, to make the bigger changes that we need. So that was kind of freeing for me to hear somebody, hear somebody saying that. Um, uh, and then, you know, another, another framework that I've been uh, using to think about this is um, Gandhi has this kind of three-part um, idea about, um, about social transformation um, and ways to make change. And there are kind of three, three really important pieces that we, that we need to do. And it's kind of like a three-legged stool. Um, so there's the, um, there's the personal transformation, um, building your own inner strength and, and connection um, and, you know, and spiritual life. Um, there's, there's protest saying no to what we don't want, saying no to what's unjust. And there are many, many, many ways to do that. Um, and not just one, um, there's a guy named Gene Sharp who's done a lot of great work on nonviolent direct action. Um, and uh, so there are many, many ways to do that. Um, and then the third thing that Gandhi talks about is constructive program, which is building the world that we want inside of the one that exists. Um, so in India, under British colonialism, that one of the parts of that was spinning their own cloth so that they didn't have to import it um, from Britain and be economically dependent in that way. Um, so, you know, I see these things playing out in our, in our actions. And, you know, when I graduated from college, I was like, I have to be a protester. You know, I have to be a, like a person who makes protests happen. And uh, protest is great and really important. Um, and there are lots of badass protesters out there. I mean, there's the youth, you know, school strikes, and there's um, my friend. My friend Jay um, took a lobster boat and blocked a huge coal shipment from coming into Brayton Point um, a few years ago, which was awesome. I mean, he was he yeah. was physically getting in the way between the coal and and the coal plant, and I I feel like that's a great model of direct action is when you can directly block something from happening, um, you know. And he wasn't he wasn't you know, offering a specific alternative to coal. He was just saying, we've got to stop burning this stuff. You know, it was just a no. Um, so that's an example of protest. Um, and then constructive program can be so many things. I mean, it can be my friends who, you know, I'm living right next to a farm right now. These, these people who are producing a lot of their own food and feeding a lot of other local families. Um, so that's one way. Um, there's also what Jason Taylor is doing. Um, he's one of the founders of HEAT and he is um, right now as we speak out doing insulation and air sealing in buildings and teaching other people how to do that and building up green jobs. And that is, um, you know, that's part of building the future that we want. So, um, so there are lots and lots of ways to do it and not everybody can do all the ways. Um, you know, I've found that I, I like to be more of a behind the scenes person. Um, I, can, I can go out in public when needed, you know, and uh, talk about things, but, um, but I also feel really satisfied by just helping things along um, in ways that are less visible. Um, so yeah, so those are some thoughts. Um, so so the, a question that comes up, uh, you know, or a, a question that I would ask people about this is, um, how do you find your own piece of the puzzle, your own piece of what we need to all do? Because we can't all do all the pieces. We can't all be community organizers and building engineers and, you know, professors and everything all at once. Um, so how do you find your piece? And some questions I would ask about that are, um, what gives you joy? What gives you more energy when you do it? Um, what helps you feel more connected to other people and to the bigger world and the bigger global struggle for survival that we're all in together. Um, and that's, that's not always going to be comfortable. Um, you know, it's not always, I'm not just saying do what you like and what's do what's fun. Um, you know, and it also doesn't exclude questions of impact. Um, we need to make sure that what we're doing is effective. But we also can't just say, okay, this is the most effective thing and I have to do it no matter what, whether it makes me miserable or not. Um, so um, yeah, so those are, some, those are some questions about that, about how we spend our time. Um, so I've got about two more little parts to what I wanna say. And one of them is about 
um, is about perspective. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to this from a perspective of enormous privilege. Um, I have a lot of choices. I, I have and have had a lot of choices about how to engage with the world. Um, there are a lot of risks that I'm not exposed to. Um, you know, I got to go to college um, and study environmental science that opened up a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm able to work for a nonprofit organization that does work that I believe in. Um, instead of, you know, having to go out and find the most money that I can because my family needs it. Um, you know, there's definitely class privilege there being able to do that. Um, and also, um, I, I had a big, um, you know, a kind of big noticing about, about racial justice and my, you know, my very limited perspective um, this year as I was thinking about um, a video that I made a few years ago about my decision on having children. Um, so there's this, um, there's a group called Conceivable Future um, that does really great work um, about helping people think about, uh, you know, whether, whether to have children or not in the, in the face of the reality of climate change. And so they have all these videos and testimonies about it from different people with all these different perspectives. Um, I really recommend checking it out. Um, and one of the videos is me a few years ago um, talking about my decision. And one of the things that I said is uh, that my child or children are going to have to face um, face things that my parents never worried about for me. You know, I worry about them starving or dying in floods or, you know, all these things that, that just weren't really things that came up for my parents. And then, uh, you know, I read this piece by Mary Anais Heglar about, about having children and, and realized, wait a sec, like those weren't things that my parents worried about, but Black mothers have been worried about the future and the safety of their children for many, many, many generations. I mean, the danger of being lynched by neighbors or police or, you know, those aren't things that my parents worry about. Those aren't things that occurred to me to, to worry about. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, I just want to acknowledge the, the very, very privileged perspective that I'm coming to this with. Um, and, you know, climate change is this huge, terrifying ex existential crisis. And, um, you know, there are other huge existential threats to people's lives and well-being that have existed before that. Um, okay, so the last, last part I want to talk about before we uh, switch over to discussion is, um, is caring for our mental health in the midst of all of this. Um, so, you know, we're all, we're all on this ongoing search for our piece of the puzzle. Um, that search may be most intense when we're younger, but, um, but it is an ongoing thing, you know, doing something and seeing how it feels and seeing how it works and, and finding other things to try. And, um, and, and it's hard because there's enormous time pressure and there's enormous, um, you know, the stakes are incredibly high. Um, so how do we care for our mental health? And, you know, it's important to care for ourselves, first of all, because um, because human beings are not disposable resources to be used, even in the struggle against climate change. Um, we are valuable in ourselves and deserve to be cared for and be happy. Um, and secondly, on just a totally practical level, um, if we're just, you know, completely burned out and broken down, we can't do this work anymore. Um, so, uh, so I have some, some thoughts about that um, from personal experience of, of getting pretty close to burned out and not able to work on environmental issues for a while. Um, so, you know, the first thing that I want to say is, is a paradox, um, which is that we are small and we matter. So any, anything that I do, any action that I take is going to be tiny in the whole scheme of the global climate um, and everything that needs to happen and all the people that are doing things. It's tiny. Um, so I can be released from the feeling of duty to save everything by myself. Um, mm. And it matters. Um, just because I'm tiny doesn't mean that I shouldn't take that action. Um, uh, yeah, it contributes to the larger whole. And it's also just, um, you know, spiritually the direction that I'm, that I'm going in my life. And that matters. Um, so we're small and we matter. Secondly, um, 
just a reminder that we're that we're all caught in a system that we didn't create. Um, you know, my whole life I've lived in homes that were heated by fossil fuels, and I feel a tremendous guilt about that. Um, and I didn't choose it. I was born inside of this system um, that I didn't that I didn't choose or create. Um, and I'm affected by it. I'm I'm complicit in it. Um, I can work to change it, but it's not my fault, and it's useless to be angry with myself for being born into this messed up system. Um, and then thing number three about mental health is just um, encouraging everybody to think about what resources you have to draw on for hope and strength. Um, close friends are really important. People who, who you know have the same, um, you know, the same feeling and the same level of, um, level of passion about this that you do. Um, it's important to find those people and to hang on to them and love them and share with them about what's going on with you. Um, cause you know, cause we can't do it alone. Um, another, another possible resource is if you have a spiritual tradition, um, maybe one that you were raised in, maybe the one that you found later, maybe one that you haven't been paying attention to for a while, um, that, you know, it's, it's not necessary, it's not for everybody, but for a lot of people, um, feeling connected to something bigger and being part of a, a community that's thinking about those connections to something bigger can be really helpful. Um, uh, in preserving our own sanity while we're doing this work on the climate. So um, that's about that's about all I wanted to say. Oh, good, I think it took about ten about fifteen minutes, which is what I intended. Um, so we can we can move it over into discussion. Um, we have a pretty small group, so that's good. We'll get we'll each get enough time to talk. I hope. Um, so for our discussion, I want to. Um, I want to encourage people to do kind of a step up, step back thing. So if you're, if you're someone who uh, knows that you speak a lot, if you can kind of hold back and, and give other people a chance. Um, and if you're somebody who um, finds it hard to speak up, I'd encourage you to try jumping in, see how it goes. Um, and um, I was going to say, try to just speak once and then, and then wait until everyone has had a chance before you speak again. Um, but our group is so small that maybe we don't have to do that. But just just kind of try to be conscious of other people and how much space uh, they have and you have. Um, so, yeah. So I think we can we could introduce ourselves. You know, tell who you are, where you're, you know, where you're coming from. Um, you could uh, tell us a question that's on your heart that you're bringing, um, if you thought of one, uh, something that's uh, that's bugging you about climate change or some, a question you're wrestling with in your life. Um, that's one possibility. I'm going to just let this go where, where people want it to. Um, uh, other possible questions, other possible things you could talk about. Um, what keeps you going? How do you, how do you protect your own sanity while, while facing this, uh, this big scary thing? Um, what do you do with fear? Um, when you, when you're facing something scary, what's your kind of, uh, gut response do you do you hide or fight or run away or do you grab onto your friends um what's your gut response and you know how do you how do you use that in your life um and then uh, another possibility is just how do you choose to engage with climate change um there are lots of different right ways to do it um so uh how do you know how, how do you discern what's right for you how do you know if something feels right or feels um feels like not the right path 